Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder if there's anyone else here who's heard of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. You might have to be a really well-read person. Now, the only reason I know about him is because... I was a metalhead in the 1980s. And so I knew the song, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Nobody else. OK, I'm all alone on that one. <laughs> he was a British poet. So he lived somewhere around, I think it's 1772 to 1834, around. So we'll see. But a lot of people know about him. If you're well read, you know about him. He's a poet. But what a lot of people don't know is that he was a theologian, too. He was a pretty well-respected theologian. And so there's a story about him, and I'll shorten it just for the purpose of today's message, where he's having a conversation with someone who doesn't believe that children should be taught about religion, not until they're old enough to decide for themselves. Well, of course, Coleridge disagrees with this position. But he's a real smart guy, so he doesn't bother engaging in an argument with the guy. He simply invites him to his home, where he knows there's kind of a patch of land that's just unkept. Weeds have grown up. It's terrible. Well, he invites the guy over, and he says, you know what? Come see my garden. <laughs> Takes the guy out to see it, and the guy says, that's not a garden. It's just a patch of weeds. And so now I'll quote him. Well, you see, I did not wish to infringe upon the liberty of the garden in any way. I was just giving the garden a chance to express itself and to choose its own production. <laughs> Today, we will be continuing in our story the rest our series, the rest of the story, where we will be looking at a lot of agrarian parables, like farming type of parables, seeds, vineyards, things like this. It's in the Bible an awful lot. So if you're new and if you don't know, the idea behind this series is that we're looking at the rest of the Bible. That's why it's called the rest of the story. And it's kind of amazing. There are people who have been Christians their whole lives, some 40 years, and they're saying, I never knew that was in there. I'm like, that's a problem. <laughs> but we're here to fix it. So that's what we're all about. We honor God's word here. This is the program guide we use here. Nothing added, nothing taken away. So we're going to take our time going through the series, and that's a good thing, looking at the rest of the story. Last week, we looked at Uzziah, and we saw that there was a lesson there, right? Staying in your lane. I talked about driving and being from New York and what that's like, and all the New Yorkers are like, uh-huh, that's exactly the way it is. So staying in your lane. Although Uzziah was powerful, he became proud, and then he wanted to be a priest. And I told you guys, there are a lot of things in the outside world, they apply, but there are a lot of things that don't. And so this is not a career, it's a calling. Today, we're going to continue along. And there's a little part I left out on purpose. We're going to get to it. So we're not doing line by line every single line. I'm relying on you guys to do some homework, some reading at home. And we cover a lot at the Bible study. But here's something I intentionally left out. So we were in 2 Kings 15, 2 Chronicles, running parallel, 26. Verse 22, though, the rest of the events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. And we did this. When Uzziah died, he was buried with his ancestors. His grave was in a nearby burial field belonging to the kings, for the people said he had leprosy. So he was supposed to be outside the camp. And his son, Jotham, became the next king. Isaiah. That's interesting. So we get the prophets weaving their way through these accounts of the kings. The Bible is not in chronological order, so what I'm attempting-ish to do for you guys is kind of put it back in chronological order. Isaiah is a big, long book, so this is going to be spread out an awful lot. But let's just go there, and we'll see the tie-in. Isaiah 1.1. These 
are the visions that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He saw these visions during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. Very interesting. So here we go, and there we are. 66 chapters, Isaiah. It's a pretty long book. Again, it spans over the reigns of four different kings. So Uzziah's reign is pretty long. Was that 52 years or so? So it's a long time, a really, really big book. So what we're going to do kind of goes in and out of these reigns. We're going to do the first six chapters, the first five, some debate where this happens, but I'm not going to make this any more confusing. We're just going to go one through five. I'm going to land on six, and we'll highlight that, and you'll see why in a minute. So prophetic book, chapter one, says it's to Judah and Jerusalem, not two different places. Jerusalem is the capital city of the region of Judah. So it can get really confusing because you'll say to Israel, to Judah, to Jacob. To... So you got to know when some things are somewhat synonymous. Here it is. It's mostly to Judah, Jerusalem. Now, what we see here is it's pretty interesting. There's some pretty strong language. He's likening them to like Sodom and Gomorrah. Oftentimes when they go after the idols. The prophet, on behalf of God, will say, you're like prostitutes. So he'll use really nasty language here. But it's interesting because if you're very familiar with the prophets, and if you have a good memory, memory and you remember like three weeks ago, we did Amos, not Amos, Amos, chapter 5. He talks a lot about false worship. And so we identified with that. We talked about when people come to church and they sing a bunch of things they don't really mean, then they go out and they treat their waitress like total garbage. <laughs> so it's kind of like that, but worse. They're living really unrighteous lives. So how does God respond to that? Take away the noise. I don't want to hear it. I'm not listening when you're praying. When you lift your hands in prayer, I'm not looking. And so the language is really, really similar here in Isaiah. Also, again, agrarian type of things. You will be like a great tree with withered leaves like a garden without water. Now, that should be bringing your mind to Jesus and the withering of the fig tree, right? Parabolic kind of thing, and Mark especially. Turn the page. The Lord's future judgment. You get a refrain in there. Human pride will be brought down, and human arrogance will be humbled. Only the Lord will be exalted on that day of judgment. Kind of sounds like that. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. We saw that last week. If we continue, continued warnings of judgment. And here we get a courtroom scene, and this is going to happen a lot in Isaiah. He sets up the scene, and he says, The Lord takes his place in court and presents his case against the people. The Lord comes forward to pronounce judgment on the elders and rulers of his people, saying this, you have devoured my vineyard. Again, fiery judgment, but he'll provide shade in the form of a cloud or a pillar of fire by night. What does this remind you of? The Exodus account. So it's like the same thing. He's going to lead his people once again. So it's the condemnation and the restoration. The condemnation and the restoration. But the restoration is a future time for them. Chapter 5, the vineyard. It's a song about a vineyard. And this reminds me of Mark 12. It starts out the same way, so you got to be thinking Jesus probably has this in mind, right? So sets up the vineyard, talks about a wine press and a watchtower. But this parable that Jesus is telling, or not this one today, but the one Jesus is telling much later, has a different purpose. It's to denounce the religious leaders of the time. They're the tenant farmers. God the Father is the owner of the field. He sends people to collect, like, the rent, but they kill them. They beat them up. So these are like the prophets, and we've learned this, that the prophets, they don't have a really good retirement plan. So <laughs> Jesus is saying that. But then the owner, the Father, will send his one and only son to collect, and they kill him too. What do you think the owner, the Father, is going to do with the vineyard? It will be destroyed. So here it says the same type of thing. He's going to destroy it. But in this case, God has given them everything they need in the vineyard to produce good grapes. But instead, they're producing bitter or sour grapes. Turn the page, we land. Isaiah 6.1. It was in the year 
king Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He, that's the Lord, was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over. I'm doomed, for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I've seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it. Don't try that at home. And said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, this is Isaiah, here I am, send me. And he said, yes, go and say to this people, listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people, plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way, they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. So, here Isaiah is cleansed, so to speak. He has filthy lips. No, he's not from New York. But anyway, <laughs> it doesn't work. I tried. Right? So, so then he answers the call. Again, it's a calling, not a career. Here I am, Lord. Use me. But God tells him the people will not listen like Isaiah did. Now, if you're familiar with the word, those scriptures sounded familiar to you. So if we go to the New Testament, we see that Jesus is cleansed. And by no way am I saying that he needs to be cleansed of sin. That's not his issue. He goes up to John the Baptist. We need to do this. John the Baptist protests. I should be, you should be baptizing me. He said, no, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So he's just... Not going through the motions, I don't want to belittle it, but he doesn't need to be cleansed of sin. But he's technically cleansed. He goes through that motion. And if we keep reading, he begins teaching. So Mark 1 happens right out the gate. And then we get to 4, and he starts teaching in parables. It takes a while longer, Matthew 3 to 13, to get to this teaching. There's a Sermon on the Mountain there and some other stuff. But I want you to notice something. It says that he teaches in parables, quite intentionally. And the disciples ask, especially in Matthew, why? Why are you teaching in parables? This is his answer. Matthew 13, 13. That is why I use parables, for they look and they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you'll not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they've closed their eyes, so they cannot see. And their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Now, if you're a keen observer, you notice that they're a little different because Jesus is quoting the Greek version of the Old Testament not the Hebrew. So you can go back all the way to the beginning of the series and see that that's a thing. That's why you might be confused if you see the quotes, and they usually almost like never match up perfectly. That's why. So Jesus is quoting it. Paul is quoting it. That's why they don't match up. But if you get a Greek Old Testament, you go, oh, if you can read that. There are English translations, though. You can always ask me, and I'll point you to them. Digression. We go back. Why does he not want them to hear and understand. It's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. So let's go back. I've taught on this before in the series, but it's important and worth repeating. The New Testament repeats this story three times. So I think we can do it twice, right? <laughs> Maybe I've done it more than that. The parable of the sower. So before that, Jesus just teaches this parable, and people get confused. There's a farmer scattering seed, and some of that seed fell on a rocky path, like pavement to us. And so the birds came and scooped it up. People stepped on it. Then 
Some fell on kind of rocky-ish soil. Couldn't really get a good root, so when it came up, it gets scorched by the sun. Then some fell among thistles, literally is what it says. So just think weeds. Came up a little bit, but it got choked out by the weeds, couldn't produce any fruit. Some falls on fertile soil, and so they grow up and produce a crop 30, 60, 100 times. That's it. So the disciples are like, why do you teach in parables? What's going on here? And Jesus says, these mysteries are revealed to you. I'll explain them to you, but not them. You see, the disciples, like Isaiah, have heard and answered the call. They left their businesses. Matthew, for example, a tax collector, buys a lot of money. He left the tax booth to follow Jesus. So interesting. Simon Peter, leave the fishing business. James and John, same thing. They've listened to the call. And they follow Jesus. They also have the hearts to understand the whole thing. So he says, so to you, I will explain everything. You understand. To those with the right hearts, the word will get in. It's a calling, but some people might not be hearing anything from the Lord. Why? Jesus explains. So he says, well, the seed is the word of God. Gets scattered on rocks. They don't get it. And so that bird, that Satan, plucks it up. What was intended to be sown into the heart, gone. Takes it away from them. The rocky-ish soil, well, those are the people that are kind of excited at first, but when persecutions come, when it gets hard, they get scorched by the hot sun. Clear reference to something. Those that fall among the thistles or the weeds, those are like the ones, yeah, they're, they're excited, but then the worries of this world, especially wealth, overtake them and it chokes them out. They can't grow or produce any fruit at all. But then the fertile soil. The word gets in there nice and deep, and then it grows up and produces a crop 30, 60, 100 times. It's a hard issue. You see, the world, the third position, so they're your heart positions. That's what it represents. The soils represent the people and their heart positions. But even if it gets in there a little, Jesus teaches the world can choke it out. The world can choke the word out. When you are surrounded, especially by the noise of the world, you can't hear the word of the Lord. Furthermore, if someone is worshiping the things of the world, their heart belongs to the world. They have hearts that can't understand. This is what Isaiah is talking about. Because it belongs to the wrong thing. That person has rejected the word. Colossians 3.5. So, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Ephesians. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. I said it last week, say it again. When God repeats it, it's kind of important. Now, a quick note on this thing. We're not talking about wealth, rich or poor. We're talking about greedy versus generous. Very important to understand. So a lot of people can't see both sides of the coin when they look at the Bible, and that's the problem. There's a time for almost <laughs> everything. So there's some people, if I put a quarter down and I put it on tails, and I said, okay, that's a quarter, right? Yeah, that's a quarter. Close your eyes. Close the person's eyes. I flip it over. I put it on heads. Open them up. Is that the same quarter? They go, nope. Interesting. They can't see both sides of the coin. And that's how it is with wealth in the Bible. It's, can you handle it? Like the young rich ruler can't. That's why Jesus says, give up everything. That's your sin. Then follow me. But we see throughout the Bible, 
New Testament, there are wealthy benefactors. Lydia in Philippi, Acts 16. She's a merchant. She makes good money, enough to have a house. Doesn't even talk about her husband. Takes care of Paul. Come stay at my house. Phoebe. The letter to the Romans that she delivered cost around $3,000 just to make one copy in today's money. One copy. It's a wealthy woman. Paul calls her like a benefactor to him. They talk about home churches. Priscilla and Aquila. There's a church in their home. A whole book of the Bible. A lot of people don't know. Philemon. You ever read Philemon? Just one chapter, but it is to a wealthy guy, Philemon. He has servants or slaves. It's not a good thing, but slaves in his house. He can afford them to the church in your home. So he writes it to the wife, Aphia, and his son. And the whole thing is he's sending Onesimus back to him. Treat him kindly because Philemon has the right to kill him. For running away. He's a powerful guy, but he's running a church in his home. And historians will say, from history, we know he was a bishop. And the cool thing is, Onesimus went from slave to bishop too. And they're some of the first Christians to be killed by Nero in the persecution. The point, we see wealthy benefactors even running churches in the Bible. You kind of need them to keep the lights on. Or now. <laughs> but they had needs. If you have a home church, you got to have money to make that happen. So it's just important to note, we have different callings. The issue time and time again is generosity, is generosity. So if you are like my wife and I a decade ago when we came into this church, we had money. We were successful business people, and no one was telling us, hey, you got to sell everything. They were telling us, you got to downgrade a little bit, <laughs> sell one of the sports cars, and then give the money to the church. So that's the deal. Be generous to the church if you can help. It's an important thing. Nobody in the church has any money. We'd probably be on the beach right now. And you'd be complaining about how hot it is out there, right? So if you like this stuff, right, so that we need the wealthy people to help us out. That's not the issue. So it's important that we're generous with what we have. It's okay to have nice things, but it is not okay to worship them. Put them up there. So, how can we tell what it is that we really worship? <laughs> it's what we spend our time and our money on. Now, in pastor school, we got put through a test. They're like, let me see your checkbook. And it's like your back to the kids' bank app, right, where you, I don't know what it is now. Your Bitcoin, right? So, check your bank app. <laughs> And check your calendar app. And some good mentors will say, let me see it. It's convicting. Really convicting. What do you spend your time and your money on? That's what you worship. <laughs> it's hard hitting. Try it. But for the normal person who doesn't want to be a pastor, pastors are called to give up a little extra because we're supposed to be leading by example. All right, so... Outside of your work hours, your family duties, what do you spend the majority of your time and money on? What are you doing outside of those responsibilities? Furthermore, this is where it begins, what do you think about the most? What's on your mind most of the time? Are you praying? Are you talking to God? Are you contemplating His Word? Did you know that's a thing? That's a thing. Check it out. Deuteronomy 6.4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. That is the Shema. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Ask a young Jewish boy to say that. They recite that constantly. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. Get a scripture stencil or something. Joshua, if we continue, 1-7, be strong and very courageous. That's where people stop. 
Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. You hear that strong and courageous part a lot, don't you? But the rest of it never makes it to the verse of the day. Think about it. Then, so how many people who subscribe to the prosperity gospel will read the rest? Right? Then, oh, no, no, wait, I have to be completely obedient to God. Then, and only then, will you prosper. Interesting. Now, here's the thing. Some of you are already going there. And I got there heady because I practiced this week. Here's the thing. That's the Old Testament. We're not under the law of Moses. Correct. But when it's reiterated in the New Testament, God is saying, keep that one. Keep that principle. So, right? I'm not going to stone anybody to death today. Right? <laughs> There's a principle. And I want to show it to you. I'm going to get a little nerdy for a second, so just hang in there. Timothy, 1 Timothy. Pastoral epistle, basically meaning it's a letter written by Paul to Timothy to give him instructions on how to be an elder, but a pastor in today's terminology. That's it. Simple as that. Telling the people what to do. Here are the qualifications for elders. This is what you should expect from your people and what you should tell your people to do. That's basically it. In the midst of that, that's the context. 1 Timothy 4, 6. In pointing these things to the brothers, out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the good doctrine you have been following. If you can read the rest, I will buy you a cup of coffee today, even though it's free. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if we look at that second line, I will read that for you. Christ Jesus, anthropomenos. I probably said that wrong. My Greek teacher is going to text me today. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not Greek. I can read it, but I can't say it great. That is a complicated word, and I've asked Greek people about it, and they say, like, Gene, you just don't understand. Like, you know, you American people, you can't. Constantly nourish is like the closest we get. I didn't use an NLT there. NASB gets it a little bit better in that particular case. But the concept is described like it's something that is constantly and perpetually nourishing you. It's just an amazing thing. They say that Greek people, they go to church and they read the scripture and let's cry. It's just beautiful, the concept. So this is about the best way I can deliver it to you. So he's telling Timothy, and so if you keep reading, the words, faith is in there, right? So pretty good. So the words of the faith, the word of God, should be constantly nourishing you in like this perpetual thing. So if you're doing the Deuteronomy thing, right, and you're just constantly contemplating and meditating on these things, what are they doing? They're nourishing you. They're nourishing you. So when the world, da, 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 the news, whatever you're looking at on the internet, and ah, ksh, this noise, no, I reject that. The words of God, that is truth. That is truth. Not this other garbage. Constantly nourish. So people come, I have problems. Well, how much are you praying? How much are you in the word? Well, not a lot. Well, of course you have problems. Of course, because you've been listening to the world. The world is problematic, <laughs> highly. That's why. Be in the Word. So if someone isn't listening to God, back on that point, why should they expect to hear Him? Think about that. Right? You have people, I'm just, Lord, I'm not hearing anything from you. <laughs> not hearing anything. He's not answering my prayers. You might want to try listening. <laughs> Like, it's crazy. You've done this and then asked why you're not hearing anything. It's nuts. You see, if someone isn't in the Word, how will they have the heart to understand? You see, many are blind, especially deaf, to the voice of God because they don't know His Word. They can't understand Him because they aren't familiar with His words. They aren't familiar with His words. And they've fallen in love with the world. I've had people come in here and say, oh, there's a lot of scriptures. I'm like, 
and that's a bad thing? You know, no, I like when you talk. I'm like, that's a problem. You're crazy. <laughs> you should want to hear from God. I'm going to explain it, but God's a little better than I am. Just a little. You see, they've chosen the world over the word. So this sounds unfamiliar. It sounds weird because that's not what I'm used to hearing and listening to all the time. And that's a problem. Their loyalty is divided. So the word can't take root. And they themselves can't produce fruit. So I want to take you to the book of James, Jesus' brother. James, it kind of reads like snapshots of Jesus' teaching, especially like the Sermon on the Mount. So he's drawing a lot from that. James 1.5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Let that soak in. Their, divide, their, their loyalty is divided between God and the world. They shouldn't expect to receive anything from God. Just a little note here. The devil can bless you too. That's what he did to Jesus. He tempted him. So some people are thinking, well, I got a, nice, a lot of nice stuff. I'm being blessed. <laughs> if it's leading you down a road of sin, it ain't from the Lord. Think about it. Read the word. So James 1 is really interesting too because it actually quotes, and it sounds like the part of Isaiah we looked, like today, looked at today, but he's quoting Isaiah 40 in the Greek. Again, preferring the Greek version of the Old Testament. And he's saying that people, he's talking about rich people now. He's like, they're like grass or a flower. When the sun scorches, they'll fade. Same kind of idea here, drawing from Isaiah. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak and get angry. Man's anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God. We can be angry. You're not God. Man's anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And it says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. That's important. Now, the end of chapter 1, 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father, oh, sorry, God and Father is this, strange wording, sorry, to look after orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Chapter 2, here's where I want to land on our final application. So he paints this scenario. So there's a lot of condemnation to the rich. And again, it's not because they're rich. It's because they're not being generous and they're showing partiality. And this is important. So he paints this picture. Listen, if one of you sees a guy come in and he specifically says, got a gold ring on his finger and fancy clothes, don't say, no, 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 take, take the best seat in the house. Don't do that. And if a poor person comes in with rags, don't say, hey, sit over there on the floor. That's the point. It's about partiality and not letting the world corrupt you and giving preference to one person over another. That's the problem. So there are two issues. If you're rich, great. Give to the church. But I shouldn't be looking like, okay, there's some rich people came out. Make sure I beeline it for them right afterwards, right? No. But people do this, and that's wrong. And they did it back in the early church. So this is what James is talking about. No. No partiality. So being in the Word means you know these instructions. And that is the key to hearing what he has to say to you, particularly towards people who are exhibiting partiality. They're powerful according to the world. And by doing that, it can make you deaf to people who might be carrying the word. He's sowing seeds, and sometimes he uses unlikely candidates to bring his word to you. That happens a lot here. 
in the beginning of my walk, I like to ignore a lot of things, if I'm being honest, but I had trouble, like, discerning stuff. People would come to me and say things, and I'd be like, why are they saying that? But as I grow in the Word, as I grow in the Lord, it's kind of like immediate. So the person will start talking, and I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> like, I know what he's saying here. And sometimes it still takes me a little while to figure out. Now, if you've been watching the messages or you were here, you saw a pretty cool testimony last week. But there's more. So I told him this testimony, and I'll, I'll just review it briefly again if you're new or whatever it is. And I sat down after the message, and my wife is looking at me like with eyes like pie plates. She doesn't normally look surprised because she's really super smart. So not too much surprises her. <laughs> she's got these eyes like, what happened? You know, I'm like checking everything. <laughs> like, you know, like, what? you know, this is not good. And she's like, there's more. And I said, okay, so there is. So just backing up. So you've got to kind of track along here. You might want to write some of this stuff down. There's going to be a lot of moving parts, and I'll try to make it easy and not talk so fast. So God has been sending a lot of people from New York in here. And it's funny because that's where we're from. A decade ago, we moved here. We're still adjusting. I'm told they still have a little bit of an accent. That's okay. Not a bad thing. It's edgy down here. Right? So, so we moved from there. We were successful business people. So we came down here. We were not coming down here as Christians. God called us into the church. I had to drop like a zero from my salary. I cried a lot. My wife, still in the business world, she takes care of a lot of the business stuff for the church. So we're different callings, right? So there you go, right? So she is out there. That's good. I'm called in here. Crying. Good. Following along? So, <laughs> really? I don't want to be poor. So, <laughs> I'm not poor. But anyway, kept some nice things. That's okay. <laughs> so, anyway, he's been sending people from New York in here. And it took me a while to figure out why. Because it's crazy. Like, crazy. Someone was sent in here from New York. And they, they worked at the same hospital where my daughter was born. And I'm like, how did you get here? Right? So, I figured out that God is telling me, just, just stay with the integrity thing. Stay in the Word. Just stay there. Just keep the course. Keep doing that. doesn't matter who doesn't like it. And you'd be surprised. A lot of you are like, how can someone not like the Bible? Trust me, a lot of people don't like the Bible. They want, and you ever see this, the big idea, they want the one or two scriptures on the screen, and there's a lot of hyping up and talking. They want, people want a motivational speech. That's what they want. They want a show, a rock concert, and a motivational speech. And even other pastors have told me, you got to give them a show and a motivational, and you're, Gene, this is mean what you're saying. I'm like, it's not even as bad as the Bible. Like, if I started reading this to you, like, just, and shutting up, and just reading this to you, you'd be like, wow. And I have. I've done Bible studies where I just read First Peter, and they're like, Dude, does it really say, yep, be happy when you suffer. <laughs> be happy when they burn you alive. It says that. Now, people don't hear that. They're like, are you crazy? What are you talking about? And literally had Deputy Johnson. It's that bad. Mega, former megachurch pastor becomes a cop. <laughs> Tells you everything you need to know <laughs> about this job. But he'll tell you the same thing. It's just a bunch of nonsense. It doesn't have anything to do with this. So when you do this, people complain. Because strangely, we're doing something different. Isn't that weird? We were talking about that this morning. One of the board members and I. People come in here. Wait a minute. This isn't like other churches. <laughs> That's sad. That's sad. Read your Bible. It's sad. But Jesus predicts that. So anyway, sending in people from New York to tell Pastor Gene, it's okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. Stay the course. The people that stay, they love the word. Ah, the hearts. They're like, yes, that sounds so good. That's refreshing. I hear that a lot. It's not me. It's the word. So he's sending people in. In this particular case, sends Beth and CJ in here. And this is like several weeks ago or whatever it is. And so I'll just go through this really fast. Sends them in. And I notice them. They're in the front with Lonnie. He's the resident fact checker. He's there in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's a good thing. We encourage that. That's actually a good thing. When there's new people, I'm like, close the Bible. That makes people very nervous. But if you know the word, no problem, right? So... They're there, and I'm like, that's not normal. Nobody sits in the front row the first time. So either they're totally crazy or, like, they get it, right? I don't know. It's either one or the other. So I beeline it for them, right? And I go up to CJ. CJ's like, hi, what's up? Throws 
Beth under the bus. We'll talk about that in counseling. Anyway, <laughs> uh, where are you from? Because nobody's from here. We're from New York. Ah, where in New York? You would know. Yes, I would. Right down the street from where I used to live. And I'm like, this is normative now at C3. This is getting crazy, right? So she goes, I, I feel like I'm home. I've tried a bunch of churches out, and I feel at home here. Welcome home. Give a big hug. We're coming to Bible study. No, you're lying. Nobody tells the truth about that. So anyway, Bible study comes. Don't expect to see anybody at all. I get changed because I don't like dressing like this during the work week. Shorts, sandals. I made a vow. I'm not going to wear shoes anymore when I move to Florida. They're uncomfortable. It's hot. So anyway, I'm getting ready for Bible study. I go upstairs. There's a room where I get changed. Not appropriate in my office because there's a camera overlooking me. That would be weird. So I go upstairs, and I go and get a pair of pants because pants are important to wear. But on my way up there... Beth, like right in my face, like as I leave the office door, I'm like, oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. So she's like, I really need to talk to you. Which is better, before or after the Bible study? Neither. Didn't say that because I'm a pastor. So I like lesser of two evils. I'm going to be hungry and tired after Bible study before. So I got to get my pants on. That's important when you're meeting with a woman. Men, put your pants on before you meet with a woman. So we have the meeting. And she says, you don't know me. I know you. And so long story short, I just basically let her talk. When pastors do this, they're waiting for you to finish. She has no problem with that. She's from New York. She's going to get through it really fast. So <laughs> anyway, it turns out that she worked for one of the martial arts instructors that worked for me in New York. One of my very few, I think I made four or five black belts, hard martial art. School with really great integrity, really good school. So that's weird, but it turns out this is a long story, but the instructors wasn't enough when we moved down here to just do their jobs and get paid or live in my house for free. They had to rob from me. <laughs> and Beth was kind of a part of that. And so she answered the call. Now, she didn't know that when she was watching me on that Sunday. She figured it out later. And she was like, uh oh, you know. <laughs> now, most of us might have just said, I think I'm going to find another church. But the Lord said, you go in there and confess. She started with, if you need to have me arrested, that's fine. No, you're forgiven as Jesus forgave me. It's all good. That's a pretty good testimony. Those are a lot of dots connecting right there. Pretty crazy. But it gets better. Bear with me. Let me just rewind to a different time. Been here 10 years. My house, 20 years old. Needs a roof. Uh-oh. <laughs> now, luckily... It's not a tile roof. House isn't that nice. It's a shingle roof, so it's a little bit cheaper. I've seen people break down in tears over replacing tile roofs. So I started thinking about the roof. I don't have businessman money coming in. Again, some nice things, but all paid for. How am I going to get a new roof? I'm getting a little nervous, if we're being honest. Pray about it. Oh, yeah, there's a guy that comes into church once in a while. He works for a roofing company. Contact him. Mike is his name. He comes over. He says, you know what? There were some windstorms or tornado things or whatever. You got some chips. I'm going to get an insurance adjuster. Sorts the whole thing out. Great. That would have been a good little testimony right there, but no. I get a message from my friend Cosmo. I'm going somewhere with this. Hold on. Just try to remember everything. <laughs> now, Cosmo is like, he used to be my best friend. He's one of the best fighters in the world. I'm not exaggerating just because I know him. It's actually a real thing. He's amazing. Really good Muay Thai guy. He teaches here in Naples at the gym that we started, but not the same location or name. They changed it. Good for them. And so there's a guy, Keith. He's from Newburgh. You know where that is. New York. We moved him down here to run that gym, and then God again, kicking and screaming, crying, called me out of it. Not supposed to do that anymore, Gene. Stop. Heather, okay, keep going. Fine. So a little jealous from time to time. <laughs> but anyway, so Cosmo, he texts me, and he's like, do you need solar panels? I'm like, where's the joke, bro? Like, you know, he's a, a fighter, a Muay Thai instructor. What are you talking to me about? So I don't get it, right? So I am not understanding any of this. I'm like, you're stupid. And he's like, no, I'm selling solar panels. I'm like, are you that old? Like, the fights aren't paying out anymore? You don't get private lessons? Like, what's going on? This is just a weird thing. And so after all the jokes and the different things like that, he wants to do, like, a Zoom meeting because he wants to sell me solar panels. I'm like, listen, I am a pastor. We don't have solar panels. Call Heather, and she'll say no, too. Right? So that's it. That's what, if you need things in the church, and she says no. 
unless it's absolutely necessary. So anyway, that's why they don't give me a checkbook. <laughs> anyway, so finally, I'm in this Zoom meeting with Cosmo, and it's ridiculous. I'm looking at somebody who's like my best friend in a Zoom meeting selling me solar panels with his like trainer guy, right? His boss, I don't know. And so they're going through the spiel, and it's a waste of my life. Like, I'm just, I don't want to do this, but I'm just trying to be nice to him. And so they're, they're saying, like, it has guarantees, and they're showing pictures about how, look, you know, the ones that had solar panels, these roofs, they survived Irma, and they're showing all these different pictures and all this stuff. And I'm like, so I'm just trying to, like, entertain myself. That's what I do, if you know me. That's what I'm doing right now. Anyway, <laughs> I go, oh, well, does it protect your roof against meteors? Because that's a thing, you know, and like Cosmo's laughing and the whole thing's ridiculous. But I start paying attention finally, and I'm like, look at the logo on the guy's shirt. I'm like, hold on a second. So I go to my drunk, junk drawer, and that's where you keep like the business cards and things that people give you. So I get Mike's card out, and I go back to the screen, and I'm like, because I don't see too good. So I go back to the, <laughs> so I'm like, that's the same logo. I was like, do you know Mike? And they're like, yeah, it's the same company. Roofing, solar panels. So that's kind of a cool thing, right? So next day or so, Cosmo calls me up. He's like, I'm at the gym. He has a Brazilian accent. I'm not going to try to do that right now. So, <laughs> you know, I'm at the gym, and here's the owner of the roofing company. His name is Lee. Talk to him. And so Lee assures me that everything's going to be fine. It's great. OK, that's kind of a cool little thing, right? How could the martial arts instructor be connected? God's like doing that, right? <laughs> Well, whatever it was, a couple days, a couple days after I gave the first testimony, CJ, his handy guy, gets offered a job with a roofing company from a guy named Lee, the same guy. <laughs> Sit on that one for like a day or so. How many connections and what is the statistical probability of that happening? I don't know. That is the rest of that story. And this is what happens in an obedient church. We can hear them. We can hear them. And so he keeps talking to us. That's what happens. That's what happens. When you have the heart to understand him, he speaks. We need to stay in a state of humility. We need to stay in the word more than the world. Now, remember, as I close today, the word of God is described as a seed by Jesus. And indeed, it comes to us like that sometimes. Something small or seemingly insignificant. Maybe it's the person who comes in with the rags and not the person with the gold ring. You guys look great. You're fine. <laughs> but if we have the right heart, you know, look, people complain about a lot of things that I say, so I try to cover all my bases. <laughs> Less emails Monday. If we have the right heart, it'll take root and grow. Check this out. Back to Isaiah. The people don't, so it won't. Isaiah 6, 11. Then I said, Lord, how long will this go on? And he replied, until their towns are empty, their houses are deserted, and the whole country is a wasteland. Until the Lord has sent everyone away, and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. If even a tenth, a remnant, survive, it will be invaded again and burned. But as a terebinth or oak tree leaves a stump when it's cut down, so Israel's stump, stump will be a holy seed. We learn that we shouldn't overlook the potential of something seemingly small or perhaps insignificant. A stump, perhaps, after a pruning that seems painful. This is how God builds his kingdom. If we go back to Matthew 13 and we continue reading, you see the parable of the tares. That's the wheat and the weeds. If we keep reading, we see this. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. God will use the smallest of all seeds to produce the greatest growth. 
if our hearts are fertile for the word. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this church that is your body, the body of Christ. Their willingness to come and have ears that hear, to have eyes that see and hearts that understand. Bless us this week as we are a blessing to everyone we encounter. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.